Hey everyone, welcome to Barter Hordes. My name is Robert. Uh, I haven't done a video in a couple of weeks. Um, I had a rather unpleasant experience after my last Friday Reads video and I just really didn't want to make videos for a while. Um, I don't really want to go into all the details now, but um, suffice it to say that I'm going to have a hair trigger on blocking and deleting people from now on. I'm just, I'm not coming on here to take anybody's abuse. So anyway, we're going to give this another shot, see how it goes. Um, quick update on the, the BookTube prize. We're in the middle of the final round. Uh, we have just over a month left for the judges to submit their ballots. I've already received uh, almost a third of them. Um, and then we'll be announcing the winner at the awards dinner here in Raleigh-Durham uh, on October 5th. And I think I said 8 o'clock, 8 p.m. Uh, we're going to have our dinner at 7 and then we'll announce the winner at 8. And I hope to live stream that announcement if we can figure out the technology. I'm sure somebody there will be able to help figure it out. I've never live streamed. Um, since the last Friday Reads, I think I've finished... I don't know, 10, 11, 12 books, and I don't want to do a hugely long video today, so I'm not going to recap all of those. I'm just going to tell you about four of them that I particularly enjoyed, and we'll go from there. The first one is by Melanie Benjamin, The Mistress of the Ritz. Uh, I read Melanie Benjamin's The Girls in the Picture, I believe it's called, um, last year or the year before, and really enjoyed it. It's historical fiction. And this one is the same. It's historical fiction, and I really enjoyed it. It is set starting in June of 1940. The Germans have just moved into Paris and are now occupying, as part of their headquarters structure, the Ritz Hotel. And the story is about the manager of the hotel, Claude, um, who has worked in Paris his whole career and has worked up to this position of manager of the Ritz or director of the Ritz. And his American wife, Blanche, they have been married since 1923, so some 16 years. And they have a somewhat troubled marriage. Um, Blanche has very American views about marriage and Claude has very French views and they don't always see eye to eye, but they have managed to stick it out. And as the, the Nazis occupy the hotel and other hotels in Paris, it becomes a story almost of the beginnings of the French resistance and how Claude and Blanche become more estranged in some ways, but are actually working for the same results. And it's based on a true story. It's based on real people, although we don't know a ton of detail about Blanche's life. Some of this has been fictionalized. Uh, but we do know a little bit about that. And so it's a story of, of Blanche and Claude both working as they can to survive the German occupation and help the resistance. And I, I really found it fascinating. I think it was a good story. The second one is, it's, matter of fact, I think all of these are historical fiction. I just got on a, a tear of historical fiction. The second one is by Lauren Willig, and it's called The Summer Country. And this is set in 1854 in Barbados. Uh, the main character, Emily Dawson, has just, she's from Bristol in England, has just inherited a sugar plantation called Peverell's uh, in Barbados when her grandfather has died. But she's been told it's not in good condition. She has no idea that it's basically a wreck. There's nothing there. The houses are fallen down. There's been a fire back in 1816 that destroyed most of the plantation. But she goes anyway and she stays with the plantation family next door, the Davenants, and through her time there and the people she meets, she starts to discover the secrets of these plantation families and the properties and her own position within this history and it's it's a fascinating almost a mystery story about who's related to whom and how and the story of the the plantation structure under slavery in Barbados the third one is a world war 1 story sort of it's it's set starting in 1914 and it's by Rachel Barenboom and it's uh, i believe it's her debut novel it's called a bend in the stars it's the story of 
two siblings, a uh, brother and sister in Russia, what we would call Ukraine today. Um, and they both lead very remarkable lives. And this is also based on somewhat true history. Um, the sister, Miri, becomes a doctor, which is extraordinarily rare for a woman at this time in Russia, and even more extraordinary because she's Jewish. Um, and then she actually ends up getting promoted to become a surgeon under kind of unusual circumstances, but she is obviously the only woman surgeon around. Her brother, Vanya, is a professor. He's a, a physicist and a mathematician, and this is at the time when Albert Einstein was trying to nail down his equations for his theory of relativity. And Einstein issued a challenge to the physicists around the world to race him to try to finish out the parts of the equations that weren't accounted for, chiefly acceleration and gravity. And so Vanya has been working on this and thinks he has a pathway to a solution. But one of the things it's going to require is a photograph of the eclipse that's coming in 1914. And this is an actual eclipse that happened. In the meantime, the war has broken out and Vanya ends up volunteering to avoid being drafted so he can choose where he wants to serve. And he goes to serve in a place where the eclipse is going to pass over in its totality so he can try to get a picture. So it's a race to get a picture of that to solve the equations and to get his family out of Russia before all the pathways out of the country close down. And so it, it is also an adventure and mystery story, but it's also fascinating the history, the math, uh, the, not only the history of medicine, but the history of uh, the, phys the physics race in the, in the 1914 era that um, drew Vanya into this contest. And I, I really enjoyed it. It's a debut novel, so I'm looking forward to anything that she writes next. And then the fourth one, which may have been my favorite of the bunch, um, is a major chunkster. It's Carl Marlante's new novel, Deep River. I did not read his debut, which he's famous for, Matterhorn, which is the novel of the Vietnam War. Um, but Marlantes writes from his own experience in both of these books. He served as, I believe, a Marine in Vietnam. But before that, he, he is from a family of Finnish descent. And this story is a family epic, and it follows three siblings who come from Finland. They have to flee Russia. Um, because of the conflicts there. They go to the Pacific Northwest, specifically around the Columbia River. So they're in Washington and Oregon and are part of the settlement of the Pacific Northwest. In this book, you find out way more than you ever thought you'd find out about logging, about um, salmon fishing, about bootlegging, and way more than you ever thought you'd want to know about the formation of the American labor movement out in the Pacific Northwest, specifically the IWW, the Wobblies. Um, one of the three siblings, the sister, is, a, is an activist in the IWW. And it's just a brilliant epic. Uh, I struggled for maybe 50 pages trying to keep some of the Finnish names straight in my head, but once I figured out who everybody was, it's just a wonderful story and how they're all interconnected and the tragedies that they suffer, um, the things that they didn't know they were getting into, that they got into. It's just a brilliant story. I don't know if it had to be 700 pages long. To be honest, I think it could have been shorter and it would have been even better. I rated this one, I think I gave it a five stars on Goodreads, but for me it's kind of hovering between four and five and partly because of the length but it's such a good book. Um, I'll have to read Matterhorn at some point, although it's another, I think it's 700 pages too. So um, I'm looking forward to that. I really liked his writing style and a book that somewhat intimidated me turned out to be just a, a very welcoming, um, wonderful read. So those are the four of my favorites from the last couple of weeks. Uh, I'm in the middle of four now, uh, two of which I'll finish today. I'm, I'm actually at the end of those four. Uh, the first one is The Old Drift by Namwali Serpil. And this is one that I'll finish later today. And it is the story of the formation of Zambia around the Victoria Falls region. Uh, and it goes all the way from 
1904, a, a short introduction from a colonial story, all the way through the middle of the last century and almost into the 21st century. And it's, it's an interlinked web of all these different stories. And I don't want to say too much about it because I'll recap it next week, but it's part um, historical fiction, it's part romance, it's part science fiction, it's part uh, fairy tale. It's, it's, it's a little bit out there. Uh, I have to admit, I'm not loving it, but I admire it. And Sarah from Hardcover Hearts talked about this on her channel recently, that she was the same way. She really admired what um, was going on, what Serple was doing, but she wasn't sure that she really liked it. For me, it's a stylistic thing that I didn't like, and I'll talk about that more next week. Uh, the other one that I'll finish later today is a short novel, Stay Up with Hugo Best by Aaron Summers. This is essentially the story of a weekend. Um, June Bloom is a 29-year-old assistant writer on a late night talk show, uh, Stay Up, and the host is Hugo Best, and the show has just had its last episode. And Hugo invites Aaron uh, not Aaron, Aaron's the author, invites June to his house in Connecticut for the weekend. Um, they don't have any kind of a relationship going into that weekend, and she's not sure what to expect out of the weekend, and neither is he. Um, but it's, it's kind of a, a story about June trying to figure out who she is as she is approaching 30, is broke, and has no job and is interested in this industry. So it, it's kind of an, an unusual story, but like I said, it's very short. It reads very quickly. Uh, the next one is a nonfiction book. It's a memoir. It's called Consent, a Memoir of Unwanted Attention by Donna Freitas. Uh, this is part memoir, part um, sociology examination, especially in light of the Me Too movement. Uh, when Donna Freitas was a graduate student, she was sexually harassed. She was stalked, essentially, by her own graduate advisor. And so she's using her own experience and her own settlement with the university um, as a case study for what, what consent means. And one of the things that I've really appreciated in this book is that she's been very open about her own sense of guilt, which a lot of survivors of this kind of harassment have expressed, but she questions her own role in this. What did she do wrong? And of course, the answer is she was a, she was abused. She didn't do it. Uh, he did. Uh, it, I don't think it ever turned into a physical relationship. I think it stopped short of that, but she was worried that the, the emotional and mental abuse was going to cross over into physical abuse with her graduate advisor. And so it's a very complicated, and having gone through graduate school myself and recognizing some of the dynamics of the relationships between graduate professors and graduate students who look to them to help them into the profession, it's, it's a, a dynamic that's fraught with power in incapacities, not incapacities, um, inconsistencies. June, uh, June, I'm, I'm the wrong character in the wrong book. Donna had no power in this situation. She was a graduate student who needed this guy's help. He was an expert in her field. He was the likely prospect to be her dissertation uh, advisor. Uh, and she was basically made so uncomfortable by him that it destroyed her graduate school experience. Um, and so I'm really appreciating how much she's going into all the different feelings of her own sense of guilt and inadequacy and what could she have done differently and then she then she talks about how it took her a while to realize that it wasn't her that was wrong it was him and so it's a really powerful memoir of that experience i'm about halfway through with that one and then the fourth one is one of my remaining three books from this year's BookTube Prize original list of 48 um, that I just haven't finished the last three. They didn't go on beyond the first round, and so I, I didn't feel compelled to read them quickly. And that's Everything Under by Daisy Johnson. And I'm about halfway through with this novel, and I honestly don't understand it. Um, I'm not sure if I like it or dislike it. I just don't get it yet. It's the structure is so hard to follow at times. I'm only half, I'm halfway through the book and I'm only just now starting to figure out how the chronology is being fractured and who some of the characters are that she's talking about. And it's got an added element where she's talking to her, 
her estranged mother in the second person for a good chunk of the book, which I find very disturbing. I, I hate second person narratives. I don't think they're comfortable. I don't think they work that well. And so I, I, I'm not really into this one yet, but um, I know it's in some ways a fractured recasting of the Oedipus myth, and some of those elements are clear, but you in no way have to know anything about Oedipus Rex to, to, to access this book because it's not made clear in any way that it's really retelling Oedipus. You just start to recognize some of the elements if you know that story. So I'm struggling with this one a little bit, but I'm halfway through. I'm going to keep plugging away because I just don't DNF books very often. But this would be a candidate uh, just because I'm not sure I understand it. Uh, the two that I'm about to start when I finish the other two that I mentioned today, um, and I don't know anything about these, one of them is called The Age of Light by Whitney Scherer, and it is described as um, a Vogue model in Paris, probably in the late 20th century, becomes a renowned photographer. And so it's this recasting of her life moving from, as the, the Goodreads description says, going from muse to artist. And then the other one I just got in the mail, it's A Particular Kind of Black Man by Tope uh, Follerin. And it is a debut novel, and it's about a Nigerian family who's living in Utah, and that's the extent of what I know about it. So those are the two I'm going to pick up when I finish um, The Old Drift and stay up with Hugo Best later today. I'll be picking up those other two this weekend and adding them to the rotation. I'm still reading on the dark side because every time I decide I'm going to read one book at a time, I get a book like The Old Drift, which is really long and not one that I particularly love, and it wants to put me into a slump, so I just I just keep going back to adding more books, and it makes it easier to get through 50 pages of a book that I'm not loving that way. Um, so there you have it. Excuse me, a frog in my throat from not talking to people for a while. Um, that's what I'm reading this weekend, and I'm going to be back with you. I have a question for you before I go. I have received, since my last book haul, more than 30 books from publishers, which is both wonderful and overwhelming. And I don't know if I want to do a really long book haul and go through 32, 33 books now. One came right before I started filming this video. Um, what's your pleasure? Do you want one massively long book haul, just book after book after book? Or do you want me to pick and choose? What would you prefer to see in a video later? Um, you know, going into early next week. And I also have a couple of tag videos that I need to, to address pretty soon. One I have kind of mapped out in my head, and that is Jasmine's literary fiction tag. I want to do that one first. And then I have two others that I, I meant to do and will get to fairly quickly. So I hope you're well. I hope you have a great weekend planned. Like the last several weekends, I will be overdosing on Premier League football, uh, even though my Newcastle United look destined to get relegated. Uh, they just look dismal, and it doesn't look like there's any hope. Uh, and to make it worse, the team I follow way down in the fifth division is just getting slaughtered week after week after week. This was a team that was in the running for a playoff spot last year for promotion, and they don't have a single point after five games. That's pretty dire, so I'm hoping they can turn it around. It's a long season, but if they don't turn it around soon, they're digging a deep hole. Uh, fortunately, my one other European team that I kind of follow, Ajax, is where they belong in first place, and so <clears throat> I'm content with that. All right, everybody, have a good weekend. Bye-bye.